The Senate will now consider the proposal from Senator Bragg, which is also shown at item 12 on today's order of business. Is the, is the proposal supported? Thank you very much. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly, and I call Senator Bragg. Thank you, Deputy President. Well, I rise to make a contribution on this uh, very important matter of uh, public importance, which is in relation to the competency of the Assistant Treasurer. And I note uh, the last contribution from Senator McKim. Uh, we also heard from uh, Senator McKim on Friday, who uh, set out some of the issues that uh, members of this place uh, have been having in their engagement with the Assistant Treasurer. And it appears as if a deal with uh, Mr Jones is not worth the paper it's written on. But in relation to this uh, minister's maladministration of this portfolio, there are a litany of examples which I seek to catalogue today for the Senate's consideration. Now, of course, the matter before us is the FAR bill, the FAR package of bills, which is about ensuring that uh, financial executives are held to account under Australian law, that there are appropriate penalties where there, there is uh, uh, problems that they preside over, where there are problems which they preside over, I should say. Now, uh, this uh, bill has been totally botched by Mr Jones. Uh, of course, this bill also contains the compensation scheme of last resort, which I would say is a very interesting idea, a very interesting idea indeed, that the Commonwealth should compensate where there has been a problem in the market, uh, which may have been caused by a market operator or it may have been caused by a regulator not doing its job. But the point is that Mr Jones in opposition campaigned for much higher compensation caps uh, in relation to this bill. But when he introduced the bill himself as a minister, of course, he reverted back to the position that the coalition had in government. So Mr Jones, again, showing that he is unable to keep a position for a period of time. But of course, when you reflect upon his tenure as the minister for financial services and the assistant treasurer, Mr Jones's first priority was to strip transparency from superannuation payments to unions and to banks and insurance companies. Mr Jones has chosen to remove transparency in a compulsory savings scheme, which is a remarkable turn of events. That someone would come into a new portfolio and, as their first act, remove the ability of a person, a worker, to see where their own money is being sent. That is a remarkable uh, beginning. Now, of course, uh, Mr Jones of course, has, has had another defeat today with the government deciding that it would remove from its own legislation the faith-based carve-out which Mr Jones proposed in opposition. Now, this policy, uh, which was his main policy in superannuation, this is his key policy, he took the election, a carve-out from the superannuation performance test for religious-based funds has been dropped today by Mr Jones uh, after the Senate gave Mr Jones some advice. Now, I note the contributions of Senator Smith and McKim during the committee process. The Senate told Mr Jones that it was not going to be able to support this strange idea that someone in a religious-based fund, of which there are only a few, should be prepared to accept a poorer return than a person in a non-religious-based fund. Uh, a very interesting precedent indeed for someone who has spent most of their career arguing the virtues of compulsory super. Now, if I was a great supporter of the compulsory superannuation scheme, I would not be wanting to open it, I would not open it up to these sort of precedents. Because once you open the door to one idea that is not about the best financial performance of the fund, then you open the floodgates to every crazy idea. And I can assure the Senate that there are many crazy ideas in relation to the expenditure of superannuation funds. Of course, today we look at the uh, Australian Financial Review, and there is an, an article referring to Mr Jones, which is uh, called Mr Jones is Out of His Depth. And it says here, across uh, the Albanese government, the Assistant Treasurer, Stephen Jones, stands out like dog's paws. It goes on to say that in the six months since he took charge of the ministry, the member for Whitlam has chewed up the furniture, rubbed his bum on the carpet, and cocked his leg over his parliamentary colleagues, the financial sector and the voters of Australia. Now, that is in the Financial Review today, and I think it's a pretty fair assessment, actually, 
of Mr Jones's tenure, that of course, after having uh, removed the transparency requirements for super, failed to protect consumers in the superannuation sector, failed to deliver any cryptocurrency uh, reforms, and of course now having lost his key, his key policy, the religious carve-out for the super funds, uh, which of course there are only two funds, uh, none of which have my super funds, uh, that is a remarkable tenure, maybe the worst assistant treasurer ever. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Senator Ayres. Well, I mean, goodness gracious me. I mean, here we are. Here we are. It's obviously, you know, term four, right? Uh, everybody's tired and got the sillies. Um, this, is, this is the greatest uh, effort at inside a baseball that you could imagine. Um, this is the week where the government is going to introduce um, sensible reforms in industrial relations that, that are going to make the country a better place, are going to be good for our workplaces. This is the week that uh, the government is going to introduce uh, you know, what, what the last government couldn't do, couldn't bring itself to do, reforms to introduce a National Integrity Commission, the National Anti-Corruption Commission. This is the week where you know, the modern Liberal Party, which had decided to tie its fortunes to the bunch of sort of ratbags and nutters and conspiracy theorists who are enlarging themselves in the Liberal Party's base in Victoria, decide to tie themselves to you know, some people who, who you wouldn't want to have a beer with, really, like you'd avoid at parties, um, the, the sort of extremists. Uh, the, the extremist takeover of the Victorian Liberal Party, and they've seen the culmination, the impact of that, you know, that uh, uh, strategy. What, what, what was the outcome? What, well, re-election of the Andrews government, uh, less Liberals, a few more Nationals, uh, and they have preference straight home and elected a few more Greens and a few inner city seats. I mean, what are to genius? What, so in this. In this week, where we're going to see the Prime Minister, the former Prime Minister, being censured, what, what, what's, it, what's Senator Bragg in here talking about? I, I mean, some arcane issue to do with the negotiation of financial sector reform. And when you look at the backdrop, you look at you look at the backdrop to this. What is the real backdrop to this? What's really going on? The previous government, and, and before that, the previous government before that, resisted, like fought tooth and nail, the idea of having the Hain Royal Commission. They didn't want it. They didn't want it to happen to protect the interests of people who had done unscrupulous things in uh, the financial services sector. Senator Bragg's friends. Done unscrupulous things. Uh, the, the interest he's in here trying to protect. Now remember, they fought so hard to stop uh, there being a proper inquiry into all of those matters. And then finally, they're forced, dragged, kicking and screaming, into having a Royal Commission uh, headed by uh, former Justice Hayne. Who did, who did a very solid piece of work, very careful piece of work. I mean, and, and don't forget the photos. I mean, there's a whole lot of bring back Josh sort of stuff going on now in Victoria, right? Bring back Josh. We had an incremental few degrees of few degrees. Oh, don't worry, I'm coming back to the topic. Don't you worry about that. The, so, so we go. So, so the, all the bring back Josh stuff. I mean, I mean, if something goes really badly, try it again. That's my, that's my, I urge the Victorian Liberal Party to do that. That would be good. But you can never forget the photos of Justice Hayne and the former Treasurer. I've never seen a more unhappy couple. You know, one, one who actually believed in proper financial regulation, one who was actually doing everything that he could to avoid it. And then we saw the sorry months and years that followed that announcement. Like no reform. Like nothing happened. 
And now we've got a government that, in a steady, careful, methodical way, is introducing reforms. Now, reform's difficult. But, but I find this MPI resolution really interesting. It's got two sentences in it. Within those two sentences, it attacks the government for not consulting and then condemns the government for consulting. I mean, this is an incoherent, um, out of place, misconceived uh, MPI. I expect that we'll see many more of them in 2023. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Senator McKim. Well, thank you, Deputy President. Uh, I placed the facts of this matter on the, the record in this chamber last week, uh, and I don't intend to labour them, but without any shadow of a doubt, uh, the Assistant Treasurer and I did have an agreement to include in the financial accountability regime civil penalties for people who breach their accountability obligations. But uh, what we saw um, last week was not just Labor uh, refusing to honour an agreement. It was one of those moments when Australians got a bit of a peek through the curtains at who actually runs this place. Last week was as transparent an exercise of power by the big business community in this country as you would ever want to see. Within 24 hours, of the agreement going public to put million dollar fines on dodgy bankers who ripped off their customers, the Labor Party folded in a screaming heap under the weight of lobbying by the big banks. Now, Shame. I remind people these are the very banks who donated well north of $400,000 in the last 12 months that we have uh, donations data for in this country. I'll tell you what, money talks and it talks very loudly indeed in this place. The other thing is it was the way the banks steamrolled the Labor Party. They weren't even slightly shy or ashamed about it. They were naked in their exercise of power. In fact, they wanted everyone in this place to see that they made the government renege on the agreement. The banks wanted everyone in the duopoly here, Labor and the LNP, who might be thinking about pushing for something that curbs bankers' power, who might be wanting to tilt the scales in favour of the customers and against the big bankers, to know that, in fact, it is the big bankers who are in charge of this place. And my word, they've got the Labor Party on a short leash. We saw that last week. Now, they don't really need the Liberal Party on a leash because they've been bred to be loyal to the big banks, <laughs> which is why Senator Bragg's motion is, quite frankly, a little bit of rubbish. The inclusion of civil penalties for individuals who breach their accountability obligations was consulted on by the former government, was the subject of consideration by the Senate Economics Committee into both the previous governments and this government's bill. So the idea that it's come out of nowhere is absolute tosh. The policy is straightforward. The public benefit is abundantly clear to the public, and we now know the only people who don't want million-dollar fines for dodgy bankers who rip off their customers are the dodgy bankers who rip off their customers that have both the major parties in this place right where they want them. Here, here. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, I must say, Senator McKim is more forgiving of the Assistant Minister than I would be in his place. And I was quite staggered. I was surprised when I heard the circumstances of the deal that was reneged on. Now, I first heard the term reneged when I used to renege when I used to um, play cards with my grandparents. And this was the first time I heard the, con the, the term reneged. You played the wrong card. You were meant to play a card of a certain um, uh, a certain uh, a club or a whatever, and you played a heart, so you reneged. That's the first time I heard the term reneged, and that's what that's what that's what's happened in this case. And I want to quote from the Sydney Morning Herald article of 24 November 2022, written by Rachel Clun, because because my main concern with this is I can understand, or I can try to understand, how the Assistant Treasurer met with Senator McKim. And maybe he did a deal he shouldn't have done. And I could understand if he actually then approached Senator McKim and said to Senator McKim, I'm sorry about that, I overstepped the mark. I didn't really understand the consequences of what I was doing. Um, the Treasurer has come down on me like a ton of bricks. I've got to retreat. 
I can understand if he did that. I can understand him making a mistake. We're all human. We're all human. Uh, I could understand that. But what really distressed me, as someone who's gotten to know Senator McKim over the last three and a half years, as a man of his word, is the assistant minister went to the press and said, and I quote, Jones said there had been no final agreement on the Greens' amendments, and there was clearly plenty of stakeholder concern about civil penalties. We've asked them what it would take to get their support for that and other bills, he said. There'd been no sign-off on anything, end quote. So he actually went to the media, he actually went to the media and, in my view, cast imputations on Senator McKim. Because there are only two people in the room. Well, I don't know how many people are in the room, but there's Senator McKim and there's the Assistant Treasurer. They can't both be right. And Senator McKim said in the same article, and I quote, there was 100 per cent categorically a deal. We looked each other in the eye and shook hands, he said. If the minister is saying there was no agreement, he is not fit to be a minister. This is a disgraceful move to renege, there's that word, renege, on our agreement, end quote. So only one of them can be right. Only one of them can be right. We're here in this chamber. We've all, we all know Senator McKim. I take Senator McKim at his word. I take Senator McKim at his word, absolutely. And I query why didn't the assistant treasurer come out and just honestly say he overstepped the mark? He made a mistake. Why didn't he do that? Why did he actually come out and say there was no final agreement when Senator McKim is so certain that there was an agreement. Why do that? Why cast dispersions on one of our fellow senators? It was totally unnecessary. And to me, that is the most concerning thing about this whole matter, that when a senator from this place, and I don't care which party, actually approaches a member of the executive and raises legitimate concerns, and the concerns Senator McKim raises in this space. I was chair of the Economics Committee, so uh, I was part of the reporting process in the last parliament of looking at this legislation. It's a very legitimate concern in relation to the level of civil penalties that senior executives in our banking industry should, should rightly face in the course of material, and we're talking about material misconduct. And some of the things that came out of the Hain Royal Commission were absolutely horrifying, horrified me as the next company secretary and general counsel of a publicly listed company. Horrified me. But what concerns me is every senator in this place, when they approach a member of the executive to have a discussion about proposed amendments to a piece of legislation, they should actually know or have faith with the member of the executive that they'll stay true to their bargain, that they'll deliver on the deal. That's the way this place needs to work. It can't work otherwise. If you can't trust, if you can't trust the members of executive to stay true to their to their word when you engage with them on a on a on, so, on a matter such as this, so that is the thing which most disturbs me: that a member of this place, a senator in this place who cares passionately about this matter, went in and had a discussion with the assistant treasurer, in good faith thought they had a deal, and then and then the assistant treasurer tips a bucket on him in the Sydney Morning Herald, in the public media. Absolutely astounding, and I think all senators should be concerned about this. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Roberts. Thank you. It seems Stephen Jones is to the Labor Party as Josh Frydenberg was to the Liberals, the bank's man in the cab government. Whether it's defending the right of the banks to bail in the cash in your account, whether it's turning a blind eye to banks closing their rural bank branches, which have increased this year under Minister Jones, or it's allowing the king's currency to be shunned so the banks can force everyone onto electronic banking. With every transaction helping bank profits and every sale providing a data and profit-rich environment for the banks. Or, as it is today, with letting banking executives off the hook for egregious behaviour that should be criminal. These hideous, inhuman banking crimes were brought to light during the Senate's Select Committee into Lending to Primary Production Customers in 2018, an inquiry that Senator Pauline Hanson got and that I chaired. Four years later, not one of those victims has been compensated, nor a banker prosecuted. Minister Chalmers is protecting the banks over the best interests of the people. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, and I'd really like to thank uh, Senator Bragg for the opportunity to talk about failures of measured policy development uh, and administration 
uh, in this place as per the terms of his uh, motion. Because uh, when it comes to failures of policy development and administration, there is, of course, no better example than those opposite. Starting indeed with the very legislation that is the subject of this motion, uh, the financial accountability regime legislation, um, because this is actually the former government's legislation. Uh, it's legislation that they promised uh, and that they failed to deliver, uh, that they failed to get through their parliament. Uh, this is legislation that is based on reforms recommended by the Hain Royal Commission. Uh, and it's legislation that just sat gathering dust under the previous government uh, since 2019. Uh, legislation that does some incredibly important things for consumers of financial services, uh, including establishing an accountability regime for financial sector companies, uh, establishing a compensation scheme of last resort for victims of financial misconduct, as well as implementing the reforms recommended by uh, the long outstanding 2016 review of small, account, uh, small amount credit uh, contracts, the SACS review, um, a review which said it was urgent to protect vulnerable people from being trapped in unsustainable debt spirals as a result of uh, payday loans uh, and consumer leases that were not operating effectively in this country. Um, this is a series of really important legislative reforms to protect consumers uh, that has been sitting there for years, ignored by the previous government. Those opposite basically had to wait for us to get into government uh, to get the work done, uh, just like they had to wait for us to get the work done on another important Royal Commission, the Aged Care Royal Commission, uh, and its recommendations for more nurses and more care time uh, legislated by us, uh, just like they waited for us to implement the findings of the Respect at Work report, just like they waited for us to take real action on climate change and legislate net zero targets. I mean, really, if you want to talk about uh, measured policy development uh, and administration as per the terms of this motion, uh, then look at the Albanese Labor government and what we've delivered in the last six months, doing what the previous government failed to do for almost a decade. They waited for us to introduce a strong and independent national anti-corruption commission, another policy that they promised uh, and yet just failed to deliver. Uh, and let's look at the previous government's record on policy development uh, and consultation. Um, we all remember the appropriate consultation undertaken uh, during the sports rot scheme, uh, during the commuter car park scheme. Uh, we remember the appropriate consultation for the, better, the Building Better Regions Fund, um, all of which had absolutely nothing to do with measured policy uh, and everything to do with rotting public funds for political gain. So if we want to talk about measured administration, uh, let's talk about a Prime Minister who secretly appointed himself to five ministries uh, without the knowledge of the ministers themselves. How did that contribute to measured policy development and administration under the previous government? And how on earth did a motion on measured policy administration uh, get through the opposition's processes and make its way to the floor of this chamber, uh, because the list of examples goes on and on and on. The legacy of the previous government uh, is a record of policy failure, of missed opportunities and neglect, confusion and chaos, and not much, what was Senator Bragg's term, not much measured policy development and administration uh, to be seen. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, in just six months, um, you know, in my 20 seconds remaining, it's impossible for me to get through what the Albanese Labor government has actually achieved. Um, Aged Care Royal Commission reforms to deliver more nurses and more care time, legislating net zero, delivering 10 days paid family domestic violence leave, setting up Jobs and Skills Australia, repealing the nasty and harmful cashless debit card, making medicines cheaper for millions of Australians, getting wages moving for Australians. These Thank are you, the Senator measured policy Walsh. responses that we your time has expired. Senator Pocock. Deputy President, I rise to speak to the urgent need 
for the government to relist the finance sector reform bills for debate this week. The reforms in these bills are urgent and overdue. The bills would immediately empower ASIC to go after predatory lenders that are avoiding the law. To give an example, the Indigenous Consumer Assistance Network is reporting that lender Signo is targeting First Nations people and are charging around 900 per cent interest, 900 per cent interest on the loans they issue. This is disgusting and clearly exploitative. We have the means to stop this. If the bill passed this week, we could go after Signo and other predatory lenders and put an end to this sector exploiting the most vulnerable in our community. I urge the government to relist the bills for consideration by the Senate. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Deputy President. And, uh, what can I say? This motion today is just money for jam. Uh, and it really just uh, proves what uh, we've been saying for a very long time, and that is the Labor Party is the party for the big end of town. And it's interesting. I'll slightly disagree with the wording of uh, my good friend and colleague, uh, Senator Braggs, where he says, the Assistant Treasurer Stephen Jones to appropriately consult um, in regards to this. I'd actually disagree with that because, as it turns out, uh, he got all the consulting he needed. He got a phone call from the former Queensland Labor Premier, Anna Bly, who, of course, is now the head of the Australian Banking Association. Now, if you, if you want a good example of just how close the big end of town, the banks, are to the Labor Party, Look no further than who's the head of the Australian Banking Association, former Queensland Premier Anna Bly. And what was Anna Bly famous for up in Queensland? We call her the Minister for Privatisation. She sold all of Queensland's all the, all the assets that belong to the Queensland people, the Queensland forestry plantations, which are freehold, for five times earnings. Five times earnings. She sold the Port of Brisbane for six times earnings, a 99-year lease for six times earnings. Gave our assets away to the mates in the big end of town and to her mates in the superannuation funds. Uh, and of course, she's got her payback. She's got her 30 pieces of silver. And of course, who is the master puppet pulling the strings behind uh, former uh, Queensland Premier Anna Bly? Uh, no less a person than the Minister uh, for Agriculture at the moment, uh, current uh, Senator Murray Watt, who is the Chief of Staff for all this. So we know that the Labor Party is in thick with the big end of town. I mean, we hear Senator Watt talking all the time how he engages with industry groups in agriculture. Well, let me tell you, as a sixth generation farmer, we don't engage with industry groups. We're too busy out in the paddock working to be hanging out with the big end of town, the blowhards. No, 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 no. This is not a party that cares about the workers. Let me tell you that. This is not a party that cares about the workers. And the history of the Labor Party and, and getting into bed with the big banks goes back, you know, there's another great example of how they sold the CBA. And of course, Senator Ayres was talking earlier on about how there's all this, you know, bad behaviour in the big banks. I'll tell you why there was bad behaviour in the big banks, because you privatised CBA without any regula regulation. At the same time, you introduce superannuation, where basically people are being the workers, having their money taken from them, given to these financial planners, many of whom you know, started working for the big banks. I mean, remember the 90s? CBA bought Colonial Mutual, National Bank bought National Mutual, Westpac did a joint venture with Bankers Trust, and ANZ uh, uh, did, did a deal with ING. So, it's the big banks again. I mean, you know, I often say that the industry super funds are out there, um, uh, good mates with Labor. But it's also the private sector as well. That's very good mates with Labor. And of course, as I've always said, and I have to sometimes remind my colleagues on this side of the chamber that Robert Menzies himself said in the Forgotten People speech that the rich and powerful can look after themselves. He made it very clear that we're about people that want to get about every day and put their nose to the grindstone. And of course, the minister for Stephen Jones, he doesn't know whether he's Arthur or Martha because he's thought he was going to get in there and save the world. And he suddenly realised that the lobbyists, the lobbyists, and I spoke about this last week, the Cory Mail reported it, lobbyists should disclose who pays them. It's not just political parties, because I tell you who's pulling the strings in the world. It's not us. I mean, I've often thought about engaging a lobbyist myself to get something done around here. Because so I can tell you, as an elected member, I'm not getting much done. As an elected representative of the people, but let me tell you, but no, no, a phone call from Anna Bly and Stephen Jones, 
the uh, Minister for um, Whitlam just suddenly pulls uh, the, the fees for the big, big end of town. And that is just so typical of the Labor Party of today. I mean, they tell me that the seismographs are, are going off in Bathurst where Ben Chiefley is rolling in his grave. Rolling in his grave. King O'Malley, rolling in his grave. The great man who actually started the Commonwealth Bank way back then, and it was also part of the Reserve Bank, and they actually had a business bank and they funded this stuff. So I'm, I'm very glad, and, and, and I think the Labor Party need to take a really good look at themselves, because this is not a party that stands up for the working class anymore. They are a party for the big end of town, big end of town, and of course we know that. We aren't surprised because the first thing they did, Stephen Jones did, was remove the disclosure requirements for super funds. I mean, I tell you what, this guy, he's, a, he's the minister for, as the Australian Financial Review called Thank him, the you, minister uh, Rennick, for the dogs. Your time has proverbial. expired. And the time for discussion uh, on this MPI has also expired. I shall now proceed to.